Hello students, welcome to the lecture on International Monetary Fund and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Discuss the evolution of international monetary system, define the concept of foreign exchange market, explain the forward exchange rate, discuss the balance of payments, define the foreign direct investment. Introduction Let's start with a brief introduction to the topic International Monetary Fund. The current debate on the IMS has generated a rich literature exploring more specifically whether the characteristic of the current IMS give rise to incentives that promote the build-up of global imbalances and if so, what are the implications for global stability. The persistence of the US dollar as a dominant international currency still implies an exorbitant privilege for the issuing country and or a trophy and type dilemma for the IMS. An IMS based on national reserve currencies should become more multicolor in nature or be complemented by a global supranatural reserve currency. Exchange rate anchoring and the accumulation of foreign assets by the official sector of emerging market economies present net costs or benefits. The high global demand for safe debt instruments has put unsustainable pressure on the financial system and excess capital flow, volatility and contagion stemming from external shocks can undermine the functioning of IMS. Who are the new rulers of the world? Their empire today is greater than the British Empire ever was. This is the center of this new empire, all within a square mile in Washington. Down the road from the White House and the U.S. Treasury is the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. These two bodies are the agents of the richest countries on Earth, especially the United States. The World Bank and the IMF were set up near the end of World War II to rebuild the economies of Europe. Later they began offering loans to poor countries, but only if they privatized their economies and allowed Western corporations free access to their raw materials and markets. Debt has really been used as an instrument um, in order for the IMF and the World Bank to get their policies um, implemented in many developing countries. And we're into a situation now where the poorest countries are in a cycle, a vicious cycle of poverty. They can't get out. And the, the kind of, of debt cancellation that's been given still will not allow them to get out of those poverty traps. It's not a question of debt forgiveness, because actually many of the debts were incurred under pressure from the international institutions or were, were given in collusion with governments which weren't acting in the, in the interests of their people. Let me ask you, do you know the difference between Tanzania and Goldman Sachs? Tanzania is a country that has a gross national product of $2.2 .2 billion and shares it between 25 million people. Goldman Sachs is an investment firm which has annual profits of $2.2 .2 billion and shares them among 161 partners. That's the world we're living in now. The World Bank says its aim is to help poor people, promoting what it calls global development. It's an ingenious system, a kind of socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor. The rich get richer on running up debt, cheap labor, and paying as little tax as possible, while the poor get poorer as their jobs and public services are cut back in order to pay just the interest on debt owed by their governments to the World Bank. Here in Indonesia, where most people are poor, the handouts to the rich have been extraordinary to say the least. Internal documents of the World Bank confirm that up to a third of the bank's loans to the dictatorship of General Suharto went into the pockets of his cronies and corrupt officials. That's around eight billion dollars. Evolution of international monetary system. An international monetary system should possess a number of desirable features. First, it should facilitate flows of international trade and investment according to comparative vantage. 
Second, it should be stable yet flexible. Stability in the market for foreign exchange minimizes the volatility of import and export prices, permitting producers and consumers to exploit fully the advantages of international specialization. Third, it should promote balance of payments adjustments to prevent disruption associated with temporary or chronic imbalances either by means of an automatic adjustment mechanism or through a mechanism that encourages domestic policy makers to correct any imbalances. Fourth, it should provide countries with sufficient liquidity to finance temporary balance of payments deficits. Fifth, given that firms engaging in international trade face many uncertainties, an ideal monetary regime would at least avoid adding further uncertainty. Sixth, as far as possible, it should allow member countries to pursue independent monetary and fiscal policies. In other words, it should allow national economic authorities to pursue divergent objectives. Concept of foreign exchange market The foreign exchange market is larger in terms of trading volume than any other market, financial or otherwise. In fact, it dwarfs all other markets. It is also the most liquid of all markets. Every transaction arising from international trade or investment must pass through the foreign exchange market since these transactions involve the exchange of currencies. Foreign exchange market is a market in which national currencies are bought and sold against one another. This market is called the foreign exchange market and not the foreign currency market because the commodity that is traded on the market is more appropriately called foreign exchange than foreign currency. The latter is only a small part of what is traded. The importance of the foreign exchange market stems from its function of determining a crucial microeconomic variable, the exchange rate, which affects to a considerable extent to the performance of economies and businesses. Market Participants Market participants are foreign exchange traders who directly or indirectly buy and sell currencies. These classes of Participants enter the market as arbitrators, hedgers, and speculators. There are five broad categories of participants in the foreign exchange market. Customers, commercial banks, other financial institutions, brokers, and central banks. The foreign exchange market is dominated by interbank operation, the buying and selling of currencies among banks. The liquidity of interbank market is due to a large volume transaction as well as the fact that banks accept an obligation of reciprocity in quoting to other interbank dealers. The size and composition of the foreign exchange market. The size of the global foreign exchange market is measured by the sum of daily turnover in foreign exchange centers around the world. This is normally done through a survey that is coordinated by the Bank for International Settlements BIS, and conducted in each financial center by the domestic central bank. Traded currency may be classified into the following groups. The US dollar, which is the most heavily traded currency for the following reasons. US financial markets are very large. US dollar is predominantly used as a means of settling international transactions. It is a major component of international reserves and it is the most widely accepted currency on the retail level internationally. The euro and the yen which are heavily traded because of the economic, financial and trade importance of euro and Japan. Currencies that are heavily traded locally but are traded internationally for the purpose of financing exports and imports. The forward exchange rate. The forward exchange rate is a rate contracted today for the delivery of a currency at a specified date in the future. This date in the future called the forward value date must be more than two business days away. Otherwise, the underlying transaction will be a spot transaction. Forward transactions are classified by forward value date into short date, maturity of one month or less, round date, a fixed date or straight date, Original terms to maturity of a whole number of months, broken dates, old dates, original maturities of less than round dates. Forward transactions are of two types, outright forward contracts and foreign exchange swaps or spot forward swaps. It involves the sale or purchase of a currency for delivery more than two business days into the future. Three kinds of foreign exchange swaps can be distinguished. Forward swaps it starts on the spot value date and end on a forward value date. Forward forward swaps which starts on a forward value date and end on a later forward date. 
overnight swaps and tom or next swaps which end on or before the spot value date interest rate parity theorem this is a classic idea in finance that gives us a way to theoretically link two currency exchange rates on the one hand we link the spot exchange rate that's just the exchange rate we can use today to exchange one currency for another for example dollars to euros or euros to dollars the interest rate parity theorem links this spot currency exchange rate with the forward exchange rate that's the exchange rate we can get if we enter into a forward contract that guarantees delivery of the currency to us in the future so it's the it's also an exchange rate but it's a forward contract to guarantee that exchange rate in the future so the interest rate parity theorem links these two and the basic idea to illustrate for example assume we're an investor and we have 100 euros and we're going to invest for a single year and we have two choices one choice here illustrated on the left is to exchange those euros into dollars today so we'll do that based on the spot currency exchange rate and then invest those dollars at the US interest rate I'm in the US I'll call that the domestic rate that means at the end of the year we'll end up with a certain number of US dollars alternatively the scenario on the right I can take the euros and invest them at a rate that is I'm gonna call the foreign rate so I'll keep the euros denominated in euros I'll get the foreign interest rate and then at the end of the year I'll exchange them into US dollars based on the forward exchange rate and because it's a forward I can lock that rate in at the beginning of the year and so I'll also under that scenario end up with US dollars at the end of the year now if I'm an investor and there's a no arbitrage uh, assumption here I should be indifferent to the choices making some simplifying assumptions and therefore I should expect the same number of US dollars in either scenario whether or not I take those euros in on the one hand exchange them into dollars today and invest domestically or keep them foreign invest them in foreign at the foreign rate and then convert them to dollars at the end of the year I should expect the same value that no arbitrage idea allows us to link the spot exchange rate with the forward exchange rate given that we do need to know these two pieces of information the forward interest rate I'm sorry the foreign interest rate and the domestic interest rate so just to illustrate if this is the hundred euros and we're gonna talk about a one we're gonna invest for one year if I take the scenario on the right if the foreign rate is three percent I'm gonna end up with a little bit over 103 euros at the end of the year and I used continuous compounding so all I did there was take the euros that I started with and multiplied by the exponential function that's e raised to the rate so we're continuously compounding times the number of years we're doing that so that's the number of Euro euros I have at the end of the year based on the foreign rate and then those will get converted based on the foreign exchange rate and that's going to give me the value of dollars that I have at the end of the year but I'll come back to this part let me take the alternative scenario where I take the 100 euros and I assume a spot exchange rate so I try to be pretty accurate here and it looks like one euro purchases about a dollar fifty seven or dollar fifty eight approximately so that means my 100 euros can be converted to one hundred and fifty seven dollars and eighty cents based on the spot currency exchange so now I'm in dollars and I have a domestic rate I just made this up of four percent and now I invest the 
domestic currency at the 4%. And again, I did continuous compounding here, so I just took the $157.80 that I have after I converted the $100 at the spot of 1.578. And I'm going to continuously compound, so that's E raised to the rate multiplied by the number of years I'm continuously compounding gets me at the end of the year I'm gonna have one hundred sixty four dollars and twenty four cents and so if we go over here to the forward rate I solved for that actually because I needed the to get the same value at the end of the year one sixty four twenty four divided by the amount of euros I'm gonna have at the end of the year if I take the alternative path that's the link right there that tells me this is the implied forward exchange rate a dollar uh, one dollar and fifty nine point four cents if that if that's the forward rate then we can see here if I have euros at the end of the year under this scenario this path of 10305 multiplied by that forward rate then I get 164.24. So I solved for this forward rate that guaranteed under this scenario where I invest at the foreign rate, I'm going to end up with the same value at the end of the year, 164.24. Now I've connected, let me just say again what I've connected, the spot currency exchange rate, the forward exchange rate, and the domestic interest rate, and the foreign interest rate. And so formulaically what I did here is applied this formula here on the left. I'm going to go down just one more right here which says this is the interest rate parity theorem. This says the forward exchange rate should be equal to the spot exchange rate multiplied by the exp e raised to or the exponential function of the difference between the domestic and the foreign rate multiplied by the number of years. And so we can see here I've applied this formula right here. I take the spot times the e raised to the difference between the rates multiplied by the number of years. And that in fact did give me the implied forward rate. That's one dollar and fifty nine cents approximately per one year unit of euro and you can see it gets the right example. The final thing I'll say is I did this under continuous compounding. Sometimes you'll see it under the formula in this format which is an annual compounding assumption. It's really the same exact idea just here we're compounding annually and here we're assuming a one-year period. I don't even have any time period in that but here if I applied this formula which is right here under annual compounding I get you can see a slightly lower implied forward exchange rate. The forward spread the forward spread is also called the forward margin the spot forward spread or the forward pickup mark down the forward spread is the difference between the forward rate and the spot rate calculated as a percentage of the latter. Balance of payments a country's balance of payment is commonly defined as a record of transaction between its residents and foreign residents over a specified period. Each transaction is recorded in accordance with the principles of double entry bookkeeping, meaning that the amount involved is entered on each of the two sides of the balance of payments accounts. We've now come to our discussion of balance of payments accounting. A lot of students find balance of payments accounting difficult and tedious, but I think it's actually very interesting, and if you'll stick with me, I think I can convince you of that. In order to understand balance of payments accounting, begin with one insight. It's all about the supply and demand for dollars. Remember our discussion of the foreign currency market? We had foreigners who demanded dollars so that they could buy stuff from the United States. And we had U.S. nationals who were supplying dollars as they bought foreign currency so they could buy goods, services, and investments from abroad. Well, in the end, all this has to balance out. The supply of dollars has to equal the demand for dollars in the end. And that's really what balance of payments accounting is recording, the supply and the demand for dollars. 
Now, whenever we're talking about the supply and demand for dollars, we're talking about international transactions. So begin with this important insight. Keep it in mind because it's the key to understanding balance of payments accounting. Every international transaction involves an exchange of money for value. Now, we can look at this transaction from either perspective, but they're both there. Say, for instance, I'm importing an apple from Mexico. What I'm doing is I'm supplying U.S. dollars to get Mexican pesos to buy an apple. So the apple is the value that's coming into my economy, and the money is going out. This is what happens when we import goods and services. Value comes in, money goes out. This dollar is being supplied to the foreign exchange markets as I bring an apple into the economy. Well, what else can we do that would accomplish the same thing? Maybe I buy a bond that represents an IOU of a British company. If I'm buying this asset from Britain, then a dollar is going out. I'm supplying U.S. dollars to the foreign currency market even as I'm importing a British investment. So money out, value in. On the other hand, suppose I am exporting, I'm producing rulers, and I'm exporting these to China. What's happening then is someone in China somewhere is exchanging the Chinese currency for U.S. dollars to pay for the rulers that are coming from my factory in Indiana. So value is going out and money is coming in. After you've added up all of these transactions, there's so much money going out, so much money coming in, and in the end it has to balance out somehow. So that's what balance of payments accounting is. It's all about balancing money going out and money coming in by looking meticulously, you might even say tediously, at all of the ways in which money flows out of an economy and flows in. Now, if we do this accounting in a logical and orderly way, we can get some other information about international trade and about the economy along the way. So what I'm going to do now is make a list of all the ways in which money and value flow between the U.S. and the rest of the world. I'm going to look at our balance of payments accounting. And along the way, I'm going to be able to answer some questions that are interesting to macroeconomists who are concerned about employment and output and consumption and all of that stuff in the U.S. economy. So when we do balance of payments accounting, we start with the most concrete transactions at the top of the ledger, and we work our way down to more and more abstract transactions. Purposes of the Balance of Payment Manual The Balance of Payments Manual serve as an international standard for the conceptual framework underlying balance of payments statistic. The manual also functions as a guide for member countries submitting regular balance of payments reports to the International Monetary Fund. The primary purposes of the manual are to provide standards for concept, definition, classification and convention and to facilitate the systematic national and international collection, organization and comparability of balance of payments and international investment position statistic. Foreign Direct Investment Foreign Direct Investment FDI from the viewpoint of the balance of payments and the International Investment Position IIP share a same conceptual framework given by the International Monetary Fund IMF. The balance of payment is a statistical statement that systematically summarizes for a specific time span the economic transaction of an economy with the rest of the world, transaction between residents and non-residents, and the IIP compiles for a specific date such as the end of a year, the value of the stock of each financial asset and liability as defined in the standard components of the balance of payments. According to the IMF and OECD definition, direct investment reflects the aim of obtaining a lasting interest by a resident entity of one economy direct investor in an enterprise that is resident in another economy. Direct investment enterprise, the lasting interest implies the existence of a long-term relationship between the direct investor and the direct investment enterprise with a significant degree of influence on the management of the latter. Direct investment involves both the initial transaction establishing the relationship between the investor and the enterprise and all subsequent capital transaction between them and among affiliated enterprises both incorporated and unincorporated. Foreign direct investment FDI is fund flow between the countries in the form of inflow or outflow by which one can able to gain some benefit from the investment whereas another can exploit the opportunity to exchange 
the productivity and find out better position through performance. Let us assume that there is a company in America. Now this company wants to invest in India. Let us see how they can do it. The firm has two options. The first option is called FDI. It stands for Foreign Direct Investment. The second option is FII which stands for Foreign Institutional Investors. Now let us see what FDI means. Consider a company ABC Limited. It manufactures its products in U US. It sells its product in US. So basically it operates in US. Now ABC Limited wants to expand their business in India. So they make a foreign direct investment into the infrastructure of a country. Let us see how they, how they do this. Now ABC Limited will open up a subsidiary that is a company called ABC India Limited. Now ABC India Limited is owned partly by ABC Limited and partly by an Indian company. So in short ABC Limited is working in India. So they start manufacturing in India, they start producing their goods in India and they start selling their products to Indians. FDI is always a long term investment which is made in the infrastructure of a country. It is very helpful for the growth of a country. Summary. Now in the end let us summarize what we have learned in this lecture. Excess capital flow volatility and contagion stemming from external shocks can undermine the functioning of the IMS. Every transaction arising from international trade or investment must pass through the foreign exchange market since these transactions involve the exchange of currencies. The importance of the foreign exchange market stems from its function of determining a crucial microeconomic variable, exchange rate, which affects to a considerable extent the performance of economies and businesses. The interval until the forward value date is calculated from the spot value date and not from the transaction date. Foreign direct investment FDI from the viewpoint of the balance of payments and the international investment position IIP share a same conceptual framework given by the International Monetary Fund IMF.